I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and it's time for some ASAP Frontline. In this episode, I want to take a chance a little bit different from what we usually use on these podcasts, which is me doing an interview of another expert, uh, of an expert in emergency medicine or other realm of healthcare. And uh, but today, there's been a couple of talks that I've done, and these are from um, the ASEP, um, Southeastern ASEP, SEC ASEP. I think there's, uh, we've got another conference in there now too, but it's in Destin every year. I've been doing it now for about 10 years, going down there and doing talks, and we've done evolutions of the opioid crisis as well as many other topics. But, you know, in this episode, I wanted to talk about one of my favorites that I've gotten to do. Um, and we've, if you're on EM Docs, you know that I was asking about it because we decided to do myth busting. One of my favorite TV shows uh, ever is Mythbusters. I uh, loved watching that show. Uh, unfortunately, they decided to retire it, but I guess there's only so much myth busting you do before you want to decide to do something else or at least take a little bit of a vacation. And in this one, uh, we found out that uh, looking into a lot of the myths, axioms, and old skeletons in the closet of healthcare, you know, some of those things that were taught that are the absolutes that were absolutely BS. And looking at some of the evidence, taking the evidence to disprove many of those. And so we took the top 10 list as recommended by docs on EM docs of myths that they um, can't stand and want to see busted. And we uh, reviewed the evidence and did a talk on it. And so I want to bring that to you here today. This is Myth Busting from SEC ASAP 2018 in Destin, Florida. All right, so we're going to talk about myth busting then and now. Um, things that have changed maybe during your practice. Remember yesterday I mentioned that 50% of what you learned in medical school will be malpracticed by the end. We just don't know what 50% yet. Well, we're going to show you some of the 50%. So if you've been practicing for a little bit, some of these are going to hit home. If you, some that have not practiced very long, you're going to think, wow, we really did that? Yes, we did. And we're going to talk about some of those things. And so where did this information come from? This information came from 17,000 ER physicians around the country on social media as voted on in terms of things they have seen, the biggest um, myths that have been busted in medicine. So um, everybody contributed to this, some that I took out because um, they were boring, and some because I didn't think they were a big deal. And so we sorted through it a little bit. So there was a little bit of creative license with this, but uh, we're going to go through this. So what are the absolutes? So that's the way this is broken down. Absolutes and then myth busted. So the absolutes, what is the truth in fact that we go with in medicine? What is the basis by which we do the practices that we do? Theoretically, it's the information. Theoretically, it's the research and evidence. But how do we know that that is actually true? How do we know that it's actually fact? Fact is, is only as good as the information that you're provided. And the way that we look and... We all know, um, looking at the research, some research is better than others. I mean, clearly, um, vaccinations cause autism. We all know that's true. Maybe that was retracted because it was complete bunk. But I've had, so I know several people who come in and still tell me that is absolutely true. How much dogma is in our practice? So how much is out there that we do just because it's the way it's always been done? I still hear that all the time. It drives me bananas when I hear, oh, well, why do we do it that way? Because that's the way it's always been done. And then why do we keep doing stuff that we know is not truth? And how do we bust these dogmatic, dogmatic practices? So the absolutes. Our first president, significant contributor to his demise, was bloodletting. Bloodletting was considered the treatment of the day. It was the way you cure things. Mass trousers. If you have a cough or your kid has got a toothache, let's give him a little cocaine, a little heroin. That'll, that'll simmer Junior right down. That's how we learn that kids don't have to breathe that often. Give them a little heroin. Their teeth don't hurt and they don't use up all that extra oxygen. So, speaking of oxygen, the first supplemental oxygen for all. We did it for years. You came in, Mona, Van Mona. You got your heart, you got chest pain. I'm going to put you on dry out your face levels of oxygen. I don't want you to just have chest pain. I want you to have chest pain and nosebleed from how much oxygen I'm throwing in there. So we're going to give everybody some oxygen. 
Well, that's crap. Oxygen hurts people. We need what we need, we don't need more. Everybody got an ABG and you're like, I wonder how our oxygen therapy is going and their PO2 is like 300 and something. Like somehow they have a higher oxygen concentration in their blood than the oxygen tank does. We find out that it's not good. It's not good for strokes. It's not good for acute coronary syndrome. It's not good for any of these things uh, of which we're going to cause vascular spasm and decrease actual circulation. By giving oxygen, you actually decrease oxygen to important things. Important things like your brain and your heart. Both things that I think we would all agree we enjoy having in good working order. But what we were doing was we were providing supplemental oxygen to the point that uh, we were causing secondary and undue harm to our patients. So now, we give as much oxygen as we need, but no more. Goal being that 90 to 98 percent. We're not going for 100. I mean, I'd, I still want to try to get somebody past 100. I haven't done it yet. I'm going to try. But that 90 to 98 is kind of where we want to be. Even with the head injuries now, we don't want them um, hyperventilation. We want to get them right on the top end of normal, but not over that range of normal. So that's a myth busted. That's number one. Number two, antibiotics for all. Everybody needs some antibiotics. z -Pak, the number one antibiotic for the common cold. Five days later, you're going to feel better with your z -Pak. Everybody gets a little antibiotic. Everybody. I, I still kind of poke fun, and I see it all the time still. You go into your uh, walk-in clinic um, and with your ankle sprain, and you get your x-ray and your z pack and your ankle still hurts, and you still got an ankle sprain, but your cold is better, if you had one, but at least you got your z pack so you don't get it again. Antibiotics. CDC reports that... 30% of all antibiotics is complete, are completely useless. I think that number is really kind of underguessing. I'm going to put closer to 60, 75, 99% of antibiotics are useless, um, that they're overprescribed. And interestingly, look at the map for where they're overprescribed. All of you are sitting right here in this room. It's interestingly the exact same map. I could put that map on my talk tomorrow for the opioids, and it would be the exact same. We clearly, in the South, have an issue with writing too many medications, no matter what it is. We have a population that loves to have a script. And unfortunately, we can't write a script for sugar pills or placebo anymore. But we want to write something. But antibiotics are clearly overused. This leading to increased resistant infections. It will cause complications down the road. And it's something we have to change. But how do we change that process? How do we change the overutilization, over-dependence on antibiotics, and I think a lot of that has to do with, with education of the public as well. There's an expectation, just like our pain treatment, that that's what they need for whatever they have going in. And I know in our area, in my area, Kentucky, every single spring, everybody gets a sinus infection that clearly needs 18 rounds of antibiotics. And it only gets better after that 18th round, three months after the onset of their sinus infection that started in early April and is going to end right before July. But then again, they're going to get that sinus infection once again in August into September and October. And nobody makes any effort at actually treating allergies, which everybody in Kentucky has. And the most common allergy in Kentucky is to, not bourbon, what's the other one? Marijuana. <laughs> Good Lord. No, horses. Horses. One of the number one allergens in the state of Kentucky is to horses. And we have them everywhere. In fact, we preserve our cities and don't let them grow so we can have plenty of room for our horses. All of our roads are named after horses. So treat the allergies, treat the symptoms, treat the cause. Don't just throw an antibiotic at it. That's another myth busted. The absolute sterile laceration repairs. You go into your lacerations, you have your patient comes in, they cut their hand on the wine glass in the bottom of the sink. They come in and you go in like you're going in with a papper. You're going to replace their knee while you're in there fixing this two, in, you know, two centimeter uh, laceration. Everything's sterile. Everybody's got non rebreathers, got the whole family, got negative pressure, got everything set up for your patient. You look like that on the left. That's not the case. One of my favorite people, I mentioned podcasts that you should enjoy, you should listen to. 
SGEM is one of them, Step Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine, Ken Milne, if you go to, he was at ASEP 17, he'll be at ASEP 18, I think I confirmed he's going to be there. He's the one that runs around with the Batman mask. It's easier because at some point he'll come in with a, with a Canada suit too, and that's pretty identifiable among an American audience, so look for the guy with the Canada suit on. Number one, with lacerations. We, are, we think that patients' concerns over infection is actually the number one cause for, for their laceration repair. It's not. Patients actually really don't care about infection. They really don't think about infection risk. We think about that. They think about aesthetics. They think about pain. They think about those types of things when you're, when you're repairing wounds. So it's not their first priority. The best solution to prevent infections is not betadine, it's not hibiclens, it's not chlorhexidine, it's running water, it's tap water. Unless your hospital gets well water. If it gets well water, we need to go with something else. But for the rest of us that have municipal water with chlorine, you're in pretty good shape. Running water is the best thing to do. What I do is I always have patients when I walk in, you know, if it's an accessible laceration, I don't want somebody having to put the back of their thigh into the sink. But if somebody comes in, usually it's extremity lacerations, I say, while I'm getting everything together here, I want you to put your hand under the sink for 10 minutes. Let it run. And they always ask what temperatures. I don't care. Whatever you like. I mean, comfortable temperature. I mean, the, the germs wash away you know, if it's cold water or hot water. So just wash it off for 10 to 15 minutes. We're going to let you do this. Just wash, 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 wash. Running water is the best preventative for, wound, for secondary infections. Non-sterile gloves are just fine. There's no difference. Save those sterile gloves. They found that the decreased infection rate with sterile gloves, but that was because the control was no gloves at all. So 2000 medicine versus 1885 medicine, yes, there's decreased risk of infection, but there's zero difference between sterile gloves and non-sterile gloves. So just grab the blue gloves off the wall. They work just fine. There's no difference in infection risk. Don't go barehanded like we do with every IV placement in the ER. You know, you put on your gloves and <laughs> pop the, this finger's clean. <laughs> We're going to talk about epinephrine here in a minute. Epinephrine is fine. I'll tell you why. That was a myth. It's going to be another one busted. In simple hand lacerations, anything less than two centimeters, basically an inch, are going to be just fine if you repair them or not. You know, we talk about, is it going to be a one millimeter wide wound? Is it going to be a two millimeter wide wound? Does anybody in here really care about wound, I mean about scars? Do all of us have scars? I got three or four scars yesterday looking for golf balls in the briars. They're all going to be two or three millimeter wounds. I lost nine golf balls. I mean, I bought 12. I can't take any of them home due to weight, so I might as well lose them, right? It's just easier in the water because then I don't have to go looking for them. Myth busted. Tourniquets. Oh, God, tourniquets were so bad. Tourniquets were killing people. You only did tourniquets if you were a homicidal maniac. And what happened, when I was in residency, uh, first year of residency in surgery, I was doing trauma. That's what you do to the ones you know that aren't going to go into surgery as a profession. They put you on trauma for four months out of that time, which I love. I kinda, I've enjoyed trauma. And I was a resident, so I didn't have to be the one doing the rectals. And you had another student, you're like, check that out. And so. You got your tourniquets. So we had a guy, no, it was a woman, it was a female. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. She was on the railroad track. Because that's where people go, right? You got trains of people. She got hit by the train. The train went right across the thighs, right across. Amputated both legs. And the patient was brought quickly to our trauma center, level one trauma center, which was about a mile from the actual railroad track. If you could take in a railroad, it was about half a mile, but yet you couldn't do that. So they had to go by ambulance. And no tourniquets were placed because tourniquets were bad. They were going to hurt somebody. The lady bleeds to death out of her legs because nobody was willing to do tourniquets because tourniquets are bad for you. Well, then. I get into residency and emergency medicine, I go in my orthopedic rotations, and we're putting tourniquets all over people. We do a knee replacement, we put tourniquets on. We just time it. I mean, anything less than like eight weeks is okay, apparently. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know how long you could put them on the OR, but we never reached that time. It was always short, it's always longer than whatever we needed. 
So tourniquets have never been shown to actually have any issue. Pre-hospital tourniquet use in Operation Iraqi Freedom effects on hemorrhage control and outcomes. They found, and if you've got fantastic eyes, young person, help the folks next to you with bifocals, see what that reads down there at the bottom. They found that they could have prevented up to 57% of deaths by earlier tourniquet use. We talk about Stop the Bleed programs that are going around the, around the country right now. That's one of the main pushes, one of the main drives is tourniquet use, is wound management and tourniquet use. We can prevent up to a third of deaths when, from penetrating trauma just by people being aware and knowing how to use tourniquets. I carry a tourniquet with me. Well, not right now, I don't have one. But in my truck, I've got one. Because if there's something I'm going to change in terms of a trauma, it's going to be stopping the bleed. You're not going to change a head injury. You're not going to stop fractures, but we can stop bleeding and buy people time. Tourniquets are perfectly fine to use, and you need to be using them. The absolutes. Everybody knew this one, right? Finger, nose, toes, and hose. You do not put epinephrine because they're going to fall off. That's what happens. Actually, that picture is from a hand from a lady who had the flu this year. But that was the coolest picture I had of necrotic fingers. Fingers, nose, toe, uh, toes, and hose for epinephrine. You can't do it. Do not do it. And it's still there. You're still going to get that warning. It's complete crap. There's never been one case associated with necrosis of a digit or anything on a human appendage because of epinephrine. Why was that found? Well, the early research was done with procainamide, with procaine. Procaine has a pH of about three, three and a half, and it was the actual pH of that that caused the necrosis. It had nothing to do with the epinephrine. It was actually just the other medication that was being used. Now, epinephrine, I mean, the actual lidocaine that most of us use now, it does have a relatively low pH, but nowhere close. What they also found was with, with this anesthetic, as it sat on the shelf, the pH actually got lower. So as it sat, it got more and more dangerous. So there was never a single documented case of necrosis associated with the epinephrine that we were providing. Another myth busted. All right, the absolute iodine and shell fatality means death. I still get calls from this every single day. The person says they can't have shrimp, but can't do that CT scan. They're allergic to iodine. Well, that sucks for their thyroid. I guess we'll have to figure that out down the road. So iodine plus shellfish plus contrast means bad news bears. Everybody still sees this, right? Everybody's still getting calls about this, right? The relationship of radi radio contrast, iodine, and seafood allergies, a medical myth exposed. Who could have done it better? It's like they were ready for this talk. Iodine is not an allergen. We all have iodine. It's the other stuff. It's the allergies not necessarily to what you think it is. It's to the other stuff associated with it. There is an increased risk of contrast. In some cases, the relative contrast was actually to what we were using back in the early 80s and had to do with the concentration and the type of contrast that were used and not necessarily what was in them. The new contrast, there is no association. So if somebody says, I'm allergic to shellfish and iodine, so I can't have your contrast allergy, then you say, well, listen, the chicken we eat today has more iodine in it than the shellfish that you would be eating. So there is nothing. There is no association between the iodine and modern contrast, and there's no shellfish allergy to the, current, uh, to the current contrast that we use. So even patients with a history of iodine allergy, I like how they put the quotes in there as well, Seafood allergy or prior contrast reaction are not a contraindication to doing those things. Now, if you need to ask, has somebody actually had a reaction to the contrast, modern contrast? So when somebody says, I have a contrast allergy, you say, when was that? They say the 80s. You say, what kind of reaction was it? They say, I stopped reading and they had to do a crike. Okay, fine. We'll, we'll let that slide. We'll, I'm not going to push that button. But if they say, it was back in the 80s and I puffed up a little bit or I had a little bit of rash, I got a little itch, I got this warm feeling inside, okay, we're going to try to give this anyway. Maybe you pre-treat with a little bit, make them feel better about themselves so that way the techs don't freak out and want you in there every moment of every day. But if it's a modern one, if they say, hey, I had, con I had an allergy to a con actual contrast six weeks ago, that's a different story. So you need to get the time frame, understanding whether it's new contrast, old contrast, or if it's related to contrast at all. Another myth, myth busted right there. The absolute, somebody asked me about this yesterday. Who asked me about it? Yeah, there you go. 
Here it is. Allergy to penicillin means no cephalosporin. They're going to explode and die. I was always told because the um, allergy was to, because the early cephalosporins actually had some penicillin in them. Um, but the use of cephalosporins in penicillin allergic patients, a literature review, there's actually very little association. What it is, there's not an actual allergy to penicillin. The allergy is to one of the side chains to penicillin. I guess the R1. The early first generation cephalosporins, and specifically one first generation cephalosporin, had a very similar side chain. So it looked similar to penicillin. So only one of them. So there's about a 10% cross reactivity with a legitimate penicillin, penicillin allergy to a first and maybe second generation cephalosporin. There is zero cross reactivity with third and fourth generation cephalosporins. There's none at all. But you order Rosefin for that person who had a night out on the town and they can't remember it, but they now know they did something. And it's going to warn you. It's going to, it's going to get all freaky on you and say, oh my gosh, you can't do that. Epic. Boop, boop, boop. As it does with everything, you can write that off. Inaccurate warning. I mean, I, I want to have a free text to say, this is dumb. Quit reminding me about this. And I hope some guy at some point is going to read it and say, that's a good point. We need to stop warning for this. But they're not going to do it. The overall cross-reactivity rate is less than 1%. Again, first, first generation, second generation, actually just one specific first generation. Interestingly, penicillin allergy is a myth, kind of. Somewhere between 80 and 95% of those who report a penicillin allergy have no penicillin allergy at all. Why is it? They got their virus when they were a kid, and they got their penicillin, and they got a rash. We all learn about that rash, but we still label them as allergic to penicillin. Oh, yes, and that's a good one, too. It is inherited. It is inherited. It's, it's just like your dowry, your penicillin allergy comes down from your grandparents. There is no inherited thing associated with penicillin allergies, even those that do actually do have penicillin allergy. So mind blown, most people don't have a penicillin allergy and you can still give your cephalosporins. Myth busted. Don't let people with concussions fall asleep. We all know this one, we still get this one, right? How long do I need to keep Junior awake? I don't know, as long as you guys wanna have a terrible relationship because you're both gonna be pissed off at each other. Okay, so, you know, when you start talking about while I sit here and chit chat. So you want to make sure you keep your head injuries awake and I can imagine if I'm trying to keep my 10 year old awake at 2 in the morning, this is what it's going to look like. Everybody loves this scene, right? It's one of the best movies ever. The best movies. I wish they'd make a second one. And all these, ca all these cameos. So there is no benefit to putting, keeping anybody who's had a head injury awake. So why, did, why was that the case? It came from an era before we had a way to know. Right now, we actually had a talk yesterday on decreasing some of the CT scan exposures, radiation exposure. Well, you know, right now you walk in the room, you know you got PCARN rules where you're like, what happened? I got a head injury. Okay, what's have symptoms? All right, let's get you a CT scan. Let's go ahead and throw you through there. You're going to be good. Or MRIs, CT scan MRI. We can tell now whether somebody has a potentially life-threatening bleed or not. We are picking almost all of these up. And the reason we were trying to keep people awake was because we didn't have a way to figure that out. It was before we had CT scans. It was before MRIs. All we had was x-ray and gumption. And you would just hope that you would pick it up because they would start to fade on you. You say, oh, there's something bad going on. And you go in, and that's when somebody get their flint tip spear, and they drill out a, a trip do a trephination on your skull. That was the whole reason for it. We didn't have a way to know whether you had a bleed or not, so the only thing we could do is watch you. That's not the case anymore. You can feel comfortable saying, listen, everybody, whether it's from PCARN rules that says I don't need to scan you, or it's the fact that I have scanned you and I know there's not an increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage, or that there's no intracranial hemorrhage, or even people are on the anticoagulants, you can say there's decreased risk, there's a small risk that you're going to have a delayed bleed. Here are the symptoms to look for, but everybody get a decent night's sleep, okay? Everybody get some rest. 
because then we don't want everybody to be in a bad mood. That's what I tell families. Do I need to keep them awake? No. The only thing that's going to be achieved by keeping them awake is you're both going to be in a terrible mood. Let's all get some rest, get some sleep. That's actually one of the best things for head injuries anyway. Oh, spinal immobilization. Who does EMS? EMS? Yeah. I still see backboards all the time. So I mentioned already my year in surgery and um, doing trauma. In our policy then, and we, would, we served all of East Tennessee when I was there, and into western North Carolina and the southeastern Kentucky, if you had an injury or a trauma, you were on a backboard. And you stayed on that backboard until we got a read on the CT scans. That was before digital CT. So we printed out films. Boop, 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 boop. We have 8,000 films, pictures. We have to go in there, get the radiologist to put them all up and look through them and do all that other stuff. And people would be on their boards for four or six hours. You got old granny. You can imagine a 95-year-old that's got zero fat in her zip code, and she's sitting on a board for six hours. How long does it take to get a early stages of a pressure ulcer? It's not long. It is not long, especially on granny. We got 15 minutes. You roll over, and they got a red spot right there that is the next infection waiting to happen. So spinal immobilization. So what have we found? Position statement. Here's a position statement. Um, from our friends, uh, EMS friends, EMS spinal precautions and the use of long boards, long backboards. Um, one thing is EM, from the EMS and emergency medicine standpoint, we were kind of buying into this early. We had to wait for the statement to come out from the American College of, Tra of Surgeons from Trauma Sign to say, hey, we're on board with this as well. Talking with my friend uh, Anthony over here, he still states they're getting some flack from certain hospitals because they're not on backboards, because we're not protecting them. The research shows that the cots, the way the cots are designed for EMS are better immobilization than the board itself. The board actually increases instability. It's a flat plastic surface that we can use in the winter to sled. The top side, so when I strap somebody down, they're moving around. This is a good slick surface for sledding. Well, so you're sliding around. Uh oh, what have, what have I got to do? Oh, I'm going to tape the head down really tight and put on a C collar so that their head stays still while the rest of their body moves around. And so what we're finding is we had increased risk of injuries, not just spinal associated injuries, but increased risk of other types of injuries, pain, pressure ulcers. I mean, if you're on a board for an hour, you're going to end up scanning the whole back because now the whole thing hurts. Neck injuries, very similar. Has anybody seen a C collar? You've seen a couple, right? You've seen uh, what it does? Has anybody tried one on? It's incredibly uncomfortable. It's like the least natural thing ever. Well, it's not ever, but it's right up there. It's the top 10. It's incredibly uncomfortable. It's not really even anatomic. You're, it's either too short, it's too long, it's too thin, it's too fat, it's too sideways. And inevitably, somebody's breathing through the trach hole because the bar's up here, the one that's supposed to hold their chin. And especially a demented patient, they can always figure out how to get their face up under the thing itself. And so you walk in, and they're sitting there like, this is hurting a little bit because you got your mouth in the neck hole. So it's not a great thing to do. So here's the step. If you, if you don't have it in your hospital, you don't have it in your EMS agency, here are the recommendations right here. Patients for whom, for whom immobilization on backboard is not necessary. Normal level of consciousness, GCS 15. No spinal tenderness, point tenderness. Or anatomic abnormality, no step-offs. No neurologic deficits, no distracting injury, no intoxication. As we mentioned yesterday, a little bit of alcohol doesn't mean anything, but significant intoxication to the point you think it's altering somebody. If that's the case, they do not need a backboard. And actually, I think where we're going to be very soon is going to be the fact that unless it's something that you can't even keep them safe, you're still going to do the stretcher. That the backboard is only for extraction and initial transport to the bed. And then the C-collar is going to follow. Unfortunately, the C-collar data is just as bad for being increasing injuries and not increasing benefit, but we haven't gotten everybody on board yet that says we need to get rid of them. I'm kind of pushing it, but we're not quite there yet. So myth busted. The absolute. Leave it to Kentucky and to find a horse in a CT scanner. We actually have those. We used to send our obese patients to the horse hospitals. Uh, to get x-rays because the only place that had enough room for them and now we can't do it because apparently they got sad about it. They, they said it hurt their feelings so now we just don't do anything. 
IV contrast kills kidneys. Everybody's heard that, and you still got that fight, right? Hey, they got a GFR of 48. Do you still want us to do this thing to potentially diagnose a significant thing that we'd have to intervene on that if we don't find it could kill them? Yeah, let's try it. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. Acute kidney injury after computed tomography and meta-analysis, looking at the research in terms of what's available. There is a slight risk of short-term bump in creatinine, but there is no increased risk comparative to baseline for needing long-term dialysis or intervention or, or long-term kidney failure. What they found was the kidney issues had nothing to do with the contrast. It actually has to do with the disease process itself. So what's one of the definitions for sepsis? It's end organ damage. Maybe your kidneys is an end organ that's going to get damaged. Or high blood pressure, end organ damage. Maybe your kidneys. What we found is there was no association between the IV contrast and the actual kidney injury. There was at, the only association was the disease process itself. So somebody's going to lose kidney, it's because of the disease, not because of the contrast you're giving them to diagnose that disease. The good news is you really don't have that much need for it anymore anyway for a lot of procedures. Even the radiology literature, even though they're going to say it in their report that it's limited because of no IV contrast, even they show, show that they're not going to miss something significant, especially on the abdomen, without, without IV and PO contrast, but IV is the only one we worry about. But when you're dealing with strokes, too, when we have the CTAs, we have the CT perfusions, we have things like that, but don't worry about it. Get in there, do what the patient needs. We want to limit radiation exposure and limit contrast exposure if we can, but don't worry about it if it's going to be something that's going to benefit the patient. They say the GFR is 30. All right, well, they got a stroke. The only way I know if I can try to fix this stroke is to know what it looks like. Otherwise, they've got a stroke and, norm and kind of sucky kidneys. So acute kidney, that one's gone. Here's your bonus one. We're wrapping up. Here's your bonus one. This is my uh, physician's assistant, uh, Howard Bennett. He's been practicing, started in EMS. He's now, been a he's now been a PA for 25 years. When he was a paramedic, they did, uh, anybody here ever heard of rotating tourniquets for congestive heart failure? Golly, how did you guys, there's so many. Are you all that old? Goodness gracious. He told me, and I was slack-jawed. I didn't see patients for like three hours because I was so shocked. We just let we just shut the place down. So we got to close the ER. We're having to come to we're kind of come to terms with rotating tourniquets for CHF. So rotating tourniquets for CHF. You would have two or three tourniquets, and you would just rotate them around again with tourniquets. We have to take them off. We don't want things to fall off. So we're combining two sins: a tourniquet and congestive heart failure. We have to figure out how to get it going. So we're going to rotate our tourniquets to decrease that flow and hopefully allow so to, to sequester more fluid out uh, and, and decrease the CHF exacerbation. So that was key. Can you imagine in the back of an ambulance? Tony, did you do that? Did you rotate them? Like, we need more tourniquets stat. We've got a heart failure. We've got to fix right now. <laughs> Take-home message. Medical truths are only as good as the current data we have. That's why we have to stay up to date on the current data, because it's going to change. But the issue is we don't even change when we have the data. Remember yesterday I mentioned it's easier to never do than it is to undo? A lot of these things are in practice. It's hard to get them back out of practice. Change is very slow. Backboards, epinephrine in, in ACS, we talked about that yesterday. Increase ROSC to hospital, but decrease survival and neurologic impact. Contrasted abdominal CTs. You know, it's one thing to take home, and I'm going to steal this from Ken, and I already told him that he was in this talk, but I wasn't going to give him any type of royalties or anything for it. He said that's fine. Nothing law is going to do it anyway, so. Ken Milne, always be skeptical, even if you hear it on his podcast. So always be skeptical of everything you hear. Research it, look into it, see where the data is, the quality of the data, and always stay up to date, and always have an open mind to be willing to change your practice based on the new data. Don't be too proud that what we've done is not necessarily the best practice. It's going to change as we go. Many of you are starting to discover that 50% that's malpractice. Some of us are still at that 10 to 25% of it's malpractice. For some of you, you haven't even gotten started, but you're going to figure it out once we get into it. So being willing to change and adapt as we go is going to be what benefits our patients in the long run. Practice is fluid. Be willing to change. We're going to be challenged with bad information, not seeking information, conflicting information, and not wanting to believe that information. 
Just because it's Nijam and just because it's Jam, it doesn't mean it's high quality. You've been listening to Myth Busting from the SEC ASAP conference in Destin, Florida, an annual conference every June, one of the first couple of weeks of June every single year. I'll be speaking there again, so if you want to come check that out, it's a fantastic conference. They only schedule talks in the morning, so you can spend the afternoon on the beach with your uh, kids and family or playing golf or doing whatever you want to do, not to mention a fantastic golf tournament one of those days. Uh, almost, I think it's every Wednesday uh, that they have that uh, there at that go- at that uh, conference so a great conference you need to come to it we speak there every year it's got great speakers uh, it involves a lot of the sec states or southern states uh, that was typically the sec but now we've added some of the other conferences as well uh, in the southeast but it's a great conference for anybody who's interested in coming down and learning some great stuff on the beach in an, in an incredible environment um, thanks for tuning in. I invite your comments or suggestions. Uh, you can email me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. That's youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Follow us on ASAP Frontline on, um, on the face page on Facebook and at Everyday Med on Twitter. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.